of this, uh, I introduce Fabricio Cajita. Uh, he is an associate professor at University Federal Minas Gerais in Belo Horizonte. Uh, he did with his undergraduate and graduate degrees. Uh, during his uh, PhD, uh, uh, it was a good time in Brazil and was funding for do, to do science. So he was able uh, to go to, uh, to visit uh, Galen Halverson, I think, uh, in McGill at that time, um, and uh, started work uh, or continued to work on chemostratigraphy at that time. He worked on uh, uh, stratigraphy and chemostratigraphy of succession in Barema uh, province in Brazil. And um, after it, he did a postdoc at the University of Western Australia with Steve Hedgeman, and I guess that's when he got interested in iron formation and iron ore. Uh, and uh, after it, he came back uh, to University of Federal Minas Gerais, where he's based now. And I'm most familiar with his work on chemostratigraphy and stratigraphy of neoproterozoic successions, but also he started to work and working on paleoproterozoic minus supergroup uh, next to his home. And today he will present work that coming from a new project that was funded by Brazilian uh, funding agency called Mob Mobile, uh, focused on mountain belts and inception of complex life on Earth. So with this, I pass it to Fabricio. Hey, thank you, Andre. Okay, so uh, if you can hear me well, um, I'll talk about uh, birth and consumption of neoptorozoic oceans and the possible uh, influence of the mountain belts that uh, were uh, given rise after this consumption in the Ediacaran Cambrian ecosystems of Western Gondwana, okay? Okay, so this is a general Gondwana map. And uh, what I wanna uh, emphasize here is that we have currently going a great debate about the Western Gondwana, or uh, if you want to call it Brazilian or Pan African origins, is that if they mainly do represent the intercontinental reworking of Archean polypterozoic blocks, and this is something that went on for the early 90s and uh, late 80s, okay? But then in the last uh, three decades or so, um, we got a lot of people that uh, started identifying all of the components we need for a phenerozoic style plate tectonics, okay? But then uh, in the last couple of years, we got some kind of revival of uh, intercontinental hypothesis by uh, various authors. So how do we solve this? Um, we have to find and recognize specific tectonic features, such as ophiolites, um, ultra high pressure rocks, uh, magmatic arcs, passive margin sequence uh, that are superseded by seen orogenic deposits, and we also can try to obtain reliable paleomagnetic data that shows that uh, continental pieces were far apart and then came together. And geophysical imaging of the crust and lithosphere, uh, where we can use to find the clues for ancient sites of subduction zones, the juxtaposing of terrains of domains of this structure and composition. So I'm going to try to show you here some of those evidence that were gathered in the past uh, three decades or so that shows that we have uh, opening enclosure of oceanic basins, uh, subduction, and then collision of continental plates in Western Gondwana. So this is a close-up of the last, um, the last map. We're showing basically here South America and Africa, Western Africa. And uh, in pink is uh, orogenic areas. And in uh, black here with some uh, blue, that's the Ediacaran Cambrian basins. We got the cratonic pieces or paleocontinental pieces that came together to form uh, Western Gondwana. Okay. So um, in the last couple of years, there has been an idea going on that we have uh, some kind of protrusions like Central African block that would uh, be composed of the Congo San Francisco Craton, uh, part of the Borborema and Trans Saharan provinces, and maybe the Kalahari Craton as well. So this is something that's uh, mainly put forward by Umberto Cordani and uh, people from the Geophysics Institute in Sao Paulo, okay? 
So uh, in Cordani's views and uh, the Grela Filho view, the Central African bloc would com be composed of this, um, all of these cratonic pieces that now are located in Central Africa and uh, Eastern South America, okay? So I'm just gonna show you some of the um, putative Ariadne threads, like uh, wh what we can use to follow uh, from one craton to another or from one craton to the reworked basement in layers or massives that are now located inside the orogenic reworked areas that could be used to interpret a uh, former protozoic continent or Central African block. And this is a work that I've been doing with Professor Altman from uh, Universidade Federal de Ouro Preto in Brazil, okay? So this is a map that we are constructing here. And what's interesting is that uh, if we do a compilation of um, uranium lead ages of igneous rocks from the Kalahari, Congo, Angola. So here I, I'm interpreting that Angola is part of the Congo uh, Craton, but it could be a separate block as well. San Francisco is just this small peninsula of the Congo Craton here. And then we have the basement of the orogenic provinces, uh, Brasilia province, Manchiqueira province is this uh, southeastern Atlantic province here. Borborema is uh, northeastern Brazil. And then the Tuareg shield uh, and the Benino Nigerian shield. And what I think is really interesting is that uh, there are some kind of um, common features that you can follow, like uh, mainly the 2.0, 2.2 origins that go through all of those uh, provinces. So you have this major peak here in Igneous Rocks that goes through. Uh, all of the basements of the province, and then the San Francisco Craton. Then when you go Congo, Angola, and Kalahari, it's a minor peak because you have also uh, mesoproterozoic origins going on. So, but you can still follow it. It would be something around Orozirian to Riasian orogenic belts. Uh, and this is in gray here, in light gray, okay? So in black is Archean, light gray is this 2.2, uh, 1.9, Giga years origins that goes through uh, Uruguay, the Rio de la Plata Claton. And you can follow this up to uh, uh, Eastern Brazil and then Northeastern Brazil, and then in the Benino Nigerian Shield and Tuareg. And you could argue that you can uh, add the West African Craton or whatever this part of the compilation. But we are just uh, sticking with this. So we can try to see if uh, there are, there is enough evidence for this former Central African block or not, okay? And another uh, nice uh, Ariadne thread that we can uh, follow here, it's in yellow. In yellow, it's uh, 1.7, 1.8, 1.5 rift sequences, okay? So we can follow this from Sao Paulo up to Minas Gerais here, Central Brazil, okay? Northeastern Brazil, and we have this also in the Tuareg Shield. So probably we have some kind of proterozoic continental mass that was trying to break up at 1.8, 1.5, okay? And if you prefer the cumulative curves as well, you can see the high jump here in 2.0, 2.2 ages in all of those um, continental pieces, okay? But uh, I've shown you the viewpoint of Cordani and Dagrela Filho that they put the Central African block outside of Rodinia, outside of Colombia. But of course you have alternative viewpoints and this is the classic uh, paper by Paul Hoffman in 91 where the Congo, San Francisco, um, West Africa, etc., Kalahari, they are part of Rodinia, right? And then you break this up and turn uh, this inside out and they're gonna meet uh, on the other side in Gondwana. And this is a um, recent paper by Johnson, not so recent anymore, 2014, where uh, it's a similar history. Uh, Congo, San Francisco and other cratons are part of Rodinia. And then you break it up here, and then they just gonna meet uh, on the other side to form Owana, okay? But whether you believe that the Central African bloc um, pieces were part of Rodinia or not, there's good evidence that uh, you have a new proterozoic ocean uh, or proterozoic ocean, because we don't really know when it's, uh, it was born, that separates the Central African bloc pieces like the San Francisco Crater and Congo Craton from the Amazonian, West African, and other components that uh, were probably in Virginia, okay? And this comes mainly uh, with this major um, units in central Brazil that uh, comprise tonalites, granodiorites, basalts, and ophiolitic rocks at 900 to 600 million years. 
And this was interpreted in 1992 by Pimentel and Fouque by, as an important new proterozoic crustal accretion event in uh, central Brazil. All of the isotopic data points out to juvenile terrain. So uh, this is not really discussed. Everyone believes in this and doesn't discuss it. So I'm not going to talk about this a lot, about the central Brazilian evidence, but we're going to talk about the other orogenic uh, regions that are more controversial, let's say. Okay, so we have the uh, Southern Atlantic provinces that in Brazil we call this Manchiqueira, but we, you can call it South Atlantic Brazilian origin or whatever. I'm not going to talk about the African counterparts because uh, the main, uh, the major part of the orogenic components they are preserved in Eastern Brazil. Okay, you have some parts of it in Africa, but uh, you have all of the components here, so you can just focus on that and see. Uh, if you can tell uh, the whole story here. And we have in Northeastern Brazil, the Boborema province where I worked uh, on my PhD, okay? So the first thing we need to do in order to understand uh, how this uh, develops in the new Proterozoic is to break up the Central African block. Uh, and we have evidence for a major mantle plume event uh, going through all of the borders of the San Francisco Congo Kratom, okay? So this was called in the, by Alexandre Chavez and others as the Bahia Ganguila Leap, okay? And uh, it's a lot of rocks that are dated uh, around 900 million years. So we have rift-related A-type bimodal suites, granite and uh, gabbro. We have mafic, ultramafic complex. Some of them are mineralized in nickel, copper, PG, and other kind of stuff. Uh, real light basalt units, uh, mainly here in the West Congo belt, where they reach up to 6,000 uh, meters thick, so really expressive uh, crystal rifting event there. Mephdite swarms, and all of them are dated at circa 900 million years. I just added here a uh, figure by Anderson Victoria, just showing how this could have uh, broken apart the San Francisco Peninsula from the Congo part of it, okay? And then afterwards, the Tonian mantle plume event is followed by rift to passive margin Tonian cryogenian basins that border the Congo, San Francisco, the Paranapanema, Kalahari, Rio de la Plata, paleocontinental margins. Those basins are composed of quartzite, platformal, carbonates, conglomerate, dimictite, etc. And all of them show typical cryptonic provenance. The younger zircons are around 900 million years. That most have come from those uh, rift volcanics that we talked about, okay? So just for the name of some of those oceans, this is the Goyas Ferrugian, where I show the accretion evidence here. The Clement Ocean, Adamastor, Coma Sea, or Damara, and then the trans Northeastern and Central African Oceans there. And just for some pictures here, this is a platform of quartzite from uh, Minas Gerais, and this is platform of carbonate, okay? And all of these, uh, they show younger the Tito Zircon around 900 million years. So, uh, we interpret this as major passive margin sequences. And uh, along it, we have uh, what is interpreted as ophiolite remnants, okay? And those are mainly as mafic, ultramafic, obducted slices that follows uh, a cretinary presence throughout the erosion. They are in green here, okay? So we have tonian to late cryogenian emplacement agents that must reflect different slices uh, they're abducted in different times during subduction of the oceanic hydrosphere. All of them show elemental geochemistry from N morb to island dark toilet, sorry, uh, showing an evolving composition according to the oceanic and subduction stage. So, just to name a few, we have here the Ribeirão da Folha that was dated by uranium lead in uh, Plagio granite zircon, and um, isotope systematics show very high uh, juvenile epsilon uranium. Some other stuff here, up to plus five. Uh, this one here, up to three, three plus five. Then if, when you go south in Brazil, it becomes a party of ophiolites. We have lots of ophiolite bodies that have been intensively studied in the past year, few years. And all of them show everything you expect for ophiolite and very positive, very juvenile, epsilon half neon, epsilon neodymium stuff, okay? Just to show you a few pictures, this is the Pirapora do Bon Jesus of Fiolite with uh, pillow lavas here. Uh, this go up to plus 3.5 and more, everything you would expect. And this is just a picture of, uh, of uh, ultramafic brushes that are in the contact 
between the ultramafic and mafic portion of, uh, of your light uh, in um, Eastern Brazil, okay? And in Southeastern uh, Brazil and Uruguay, what I think is really nice, they are really studying, uh, especially Leo Hartman um, team, the, the alteration products of the ophiolites, but the seafloor alteration, like you have uh, two marlinites, serpentinites, et cetera, and then uh, you can find hydrothermal zircon that supposedly is formed uh, by seafloor alteration, okay? And they try to constrain this by the boron isotope composition of tourmaline and by the half new isotope composition of zircon. So there's a lot of papers on this coming out right now by Leo Hartmann and uh, his team, okay? Okay, so we talked about the birth of these oceans uh, following the Tonian rifting event. But now about the consumption, uh, the Pacific margin sequence everywhere, they are superseded or trussed by uh, cenorogenic basins. They are mainly composed of immature rocks such as Greywack and volcanoclassics, volcanic classics, sorry. Uh, and the zircon provenance is really different now. We got zircons as young as circa 630, uh, 600 million years or so, okay? So I'm just gonna show this map here with a close up because here I put in yellow what's interpreted as rift and passive margin basins. And we got younger the titular zircon at 900 million years. And then in orange here, we got the cenorogenic blazes, okay? If you want to interpret this in terms of uh, ancient nomenclature like flesh and molasses. And then you got Greywack, Reddit, and Volcanic Classics uh, with really different provenance. I can show you this here. This was, was a paper by a student of mine where you have a really clear change of provenance when you go uh, up stratigraphy in this uh, orogenic area. So here is the cratonic provenance where you got uh, zircons from around 900 million years uh, through the Archean. But then when you go up the stratigraphy, uh, the Archean proterozoic zircons uh, begin to diminish and then you have this major new proterozoic peak here. So you're really changing the provenance, probably because you are arriving with arc systems, okay? So we must, must not uh, confuse the age of the shift of provenance as the end of rifting because the passive margin stage uh, also shares similar provenance, okay? So this is just a reminder. So where did this uh, post-Tonian peaks come from? From probably, Accretionary arc related rocks. So, in this map here, everything that's in purple side, in deep purple side here, is interpreted as uh, juvenile to Hanks, uh, Tony and Cryogenian juvenile to Hanks, especially here in Rio de Janeiro and in southern Brazil. And then we have in red uh, the Acheron continental arc rocks, rocks that are interpreted as developed in the uh, Andean type arcs. Okay. Both of those. Uh, represent expanded, including intermediary terms like andesite, diorite, etc., calcocline, magnesium, metaluminal, serious plotting, plotting in the volcanic arc field in the, all of the discriminant diagrams. And the uh, isotope systematics indicates participation of large amounts of mental material. There are some regional names here, but I'm not going to uh, discuss this just to show that they go through the whole province, okay? And some pictures of the tonalites and granodiorites and uh, some mafic rocks and the sites. You have volcanics, uh, also volcanics, not only plutonic rocks. And they are dated uh, from 660, 80 or so uh, through 860 million years. Um, and they all show this calcocline, magnesium, metaluminous, I type magmas, along toledic basalt. Okay. And then you have uh, on top of it, like um, intruding it, you have those rocks that are interpreted as Ediacaran continental arcs. And those are formed by uh, mainly tonalites to granodiorites with some mafic rocks, but you also got uh, volcanic rocks and volcanic classic rocks as well, okay? So here is a compilation of some uh, uranium lead ages for the northern part of the province or Arasway belt and some of the epsilon neodymium and epsilon hafnium uh, work that shows that now you're not only uh, involving mental edge magmas, but you need uh, continental crust to be contaminating, contaminating this, uh, those magmas. So this is why they're interpreted as developed in Andean type arcs and not in juvenile type uh, arcs, okay? 
So I just uh, stole this slide from Pedroza, okay? Because I think it's nice that um, this could be for touristers, of course, this could be just a coincidence, but it's really nice that the Heodosia arc rocks, the Ediacaran continental arc rocks, the tonalites with lots of mafic enclaves, diorite enclaves, etc. They really look like uh, every continental arc we go in the world. Like this is a student of mine sitting in a coastal batholith of Chile. That's interpreted as, uh, of course, as Andean type arc. And then we have here uh, me and Anderson Victoria at uh, Sierra Nevada batholith in California. And they are just really similar, okay? Okay, and interesting, in the Neoproterozoic Sinorogenic Basins that I talked about, and now I'm showing here the change in provenance, okay? So those are the Rift to Pacific Margin Basins. You can see the, the provenance here is really similar to what uh, we can see in papers like K. Wood et al. 2012, uh, will be similar to um, Rift to Pacific Margin Basins. But then in the Sinorogenic Basins, you have uh, almost a monotonic peak here, just one peak of Neoproterozoic uh, zircons that is very similar to arc related basins as per K. Wood et al. Uh, 2012. But uh, more than that, in the sinorogenic basins, we got uh, classes of uh, volcanic rocks, okay? So, class of uh, daysite and andesite, etc., they are dated around 620 million years. So, clearly for me here, you are uh, eroding uh, volcanic arcs to, to give this sinorogenic basins, okay? And you have uh, further geophysical support for two super zones, like these Bugge anomalies here, where you have the ophiolite bearing uh, accretionary webs on the what you would expect to be the lower plate. And the arc related terrains, they are always in the upper plate. And this happens here both in the Arasuei belt of the Mantiqueira province and on the other side of the San Francisco Craton as well. In fact, all of the sides of the San Francisco Craton you have this uh, lower plate, upper plate, uh, typical um, suture zones, uh, geophysical signatures, okay? And you have the elemental geochemistry data that's not the only basis for interpretation of uh, volcanic arcs, but they're surely a nice support to the field geophysical isotope evidence that I showed before. And uh, we also integrated this. Uh, so here is uh, over uh, 800, uh, epsilon half new determinations uh, in a paper that came come out uh, geochemical perspectives letters in this year that shows that from Tonian to Ediacaran, uh, you're getting less juvenile stuff, or if you want to, you're having more crucial contamination, like progressive crucial contamination when you go from Tonian to Ediacaran in those igneous rocks. Okay. And how do we interpret to explain this uh, time dependent variations? as a subduction polarity reversal model. So you start with uh, arcs that are entirely juvenile, okay? At some point, those arcs dock at the paleocontinental margins, and then you invert subduction. And as you invert subduction, you start to melt both the arc terrains and the older paleocontinental uh, crust. And then you have the Ediacaran um, contaminated uh, uh, magmas, okay? So this is how in the, Geochemical perspective letters paper that I talked about. And meanwhile, in Northeast in Brazil, what you have here in this area, so I'm going to talk about the margins of this province, okay? We have uh, New Proterozoic Oceanic Crust Remnants. This was published in 2014. Mainly in this area here is uh, 100 kilometers or so of uh, mafic rocks, this amygdaloidal metabasalts. And sometimes you have metashirt and uh, stuff like uh, meta ultramafic rocks as well, but basically lots of basic rocks and uh, chemical sediments, okay? And the chemistry and uh, neodymium isotope systematics uh, points out to probably transitional more chemistry, okay? And as in the Mantiqueira province, you got the suture zone signatures that are similar to other Precambrian uh, belts around the world, okay? And now on the other margin here, this uh, section of the province, we got a major battle that's interpreted similarly like a, a continental magmatic arc. It's called Santa Quiteria, okay? And this is a more recent paper about the Santa Quiteria battle 
where you got the main peak of magnetic activity of 650, 600 million years, but you got tonalites as older, circa 880 million years. So probably a similar story as the one that we are telling about uh, in Southeastern Brazil in that paper of the geochemical perspective. Less. You, have, you even have this uh, epsilon hafnium, epsilon iodimium going from juvenile towards uh, contaminated crust here, okay? And right beside the arc uh, terrains, what you got is retro eclogites with uh, coexist bearing uh, stuff and dated at about 615 million years. So this is really fringing. This is the arc batolite in pink and the uh, retro eclogites are fringing it here. So there's all this uh, boudons of eclogites here, okay? So this is a paper that recognized coexist bearing eclogites. And this was published by Ganadi et al. in uh, Nature Communications, where they correlated this eclogite uh, uh, sequence here with other sequences in Togo and Mali as well. Okay, so this is go up to 30 kilobars or something like that. And you have what you expected, the zircon um, cores and rings with different uh, trace element geochemistry showing that they are growing as garnet is growing. So probably the 615, 620 million years age represents the metamorphic age uh, of the eclogites, okay? Marking, so the collision of uh, continental blocks, what you would expect, here are the eclogites, and here is the, uh, the, the arc magma. So we're looking at this part here. Okay, so back to the Central African block now. Uh, what we have to do is to dismantle this block and, and start building uh, novel oceans. So we published this this year in scientific reports, how we do this by decratonizing a former uh, Central African block and then opening new oceans here through hyperstension, okay? And then after that, we have uh, new ribbon continents, okay? So we have uh, ribbon continents that will uh, afterwards be part of the orogenic regions in a reworked fashion. If you want to, you can interpret uh, what we call, what, what has been called in, in the Saharan region, for example, as metacratum. It could be like decratonized uh, ribbon continents or something like that. Because uh, what happens here is that those ribbon continents separated by new oceans, uh, as we start to build here the major battlelet uh, of the magmatic arc, and then we collide the West African paleocontinent with the eclogites here, you start to, to make this uh, rotate backwards, like a uh, windshield, windshield wiper or something like that. So they are just drifting apart and then you collide it and then they rotate backwards. This is what we call a uh, introverted erosion, right? Uh, like a Wilson cycle classic type of stuff. But the problem is uh, the major collision is coming here yet. Okay, so it's not uh, the major collision because when the Amazon collides and you close the Clement Ocean, then you start to have this kind of uh, lateral scape zones here that are pressing the ribbon continents that lost their cratonic kills during uh, decratonization. And then they will, became, they, they will become uh, highly uh, reworked in the orogenic fashion, okay? Like an accordion, but I don't wanna call these accordion tectonics because this is used for other stuff as well. So, so just looking at a broader view now, uh, we have here the goyas Ferrugian Ocean, where we have lots of juvenile stuff coming on here. And then this is what I call would be the future, uh, future extroverted origins when you close the goyas Ferrugian Ocean. But those oceans here, they will probably be future introverted origins, okay? This is what will be the, the blocks, the, the ribbon continents that will uh, leave the Central African block. And then as the remnants, as the, the offspring of Rodinia, comes over like uh, the West African Amazonian Kraton, they will collide here and close the extroverted origins. And as they close the extroverted origins, they will push back those, uh, those fragments and those fragments will come back to where they came from. So a typical Wilson cycle where the, the colliding margins are the same conjugated margins as that you start with, okay? So this is all under construction. So. I'm not gonna uh, detail this because we have to pass along to the, and explore the consequence of these collisions to the blue specks, that's the Ediacaran Cambrian foreland basin, okay? So now I'm gonna move to the low temperature 
chemistry and uh, interpretation of this. So back to the, the Akron Cambrian Forland blazons, the blue ones here. And I want to go back to this, uh, this conception here by Paul Hoffman, because in 91, right, uh, it was already stated that uh, you are opening the basins here in Laurentia and uh, Baltica. So you're getting basins that are going from a rift to passive margin stage that are becoming open to the global sea. And at the same time, you are landlocking the basins in Gondwana. Okay. So uh, there's a distinct, uh, distinct evolution of uh, Ediacaran Cambrian basins from the northern hemisphere to the southern hemisphere countries. As you're getting uh, free margins here, free continental margins, you are landlocking these, these margins here. So what could be the possible uh, scenarios and possible outcomes for those uh, Gondwana bases of that, okay? And we're gonna focus on the Bambui basin because it's the most studied of them, just as an example. So this is a stratigraphic log, a general stratigraphic log for the Bambui basin. And what we know about it, the deposition span the Diacron Cambrian with the Diacron Cambrian border somewhere midsection. We have a basal cap Dolostone that uh, it's kind of controversial, but I interpreted this as Marino. In midsection, we got remnants of Claudine, SP, Corumbella, and uh, other late Ediacaran stuff, probably above uh, non conformity. And at the base, we got phosphorite, barite, urbanite fence, everything you would expect for a post glacial cap Dolostone, cap carbonate sequence, okay? And this is kind of uh, odd. At the midsection of the bambooi, we got the middle bambooi excursion of uh, carbon isotopes, uh, where they actually, we got delta 13 carbon up to plus 15, plus 16. Here, I just drawn it up to plus 10, but they go, they go up above that. So this is really uh, not what is expected for uh, late Ediacaran, early Cambrian basins, okay? We're gonna talk about it. So this is just for the base of the, of the sequence where you got the glacial stuff with uh, serrated pavements and diamictites sitting above that, just to show you that they exist. We're talking about this formation here, okay? And then on top of that, we got a cap double stone, cap uh, carbonate sequence uh, with barite and uh, with phosphorite, et cetera. And this is Gabriel Ulan here, just uh, pointing the barite sites. Uh, we analyzed these barites along with uh, Peter Crockford and others, and they, they preserved the, the, the triple oxygen uh, anomaly that uh, probably was generated by uh, damage to the ozone layer uh, during the glacial post-glacial period. And you can see that everywhere uh, in post marino and capital stones, right? Uh, Peter Crockford uh, even uh, suggested that this could be a global marker, okay? Global stratigraphic marker there. And then on top of that, this is the outcrop that uh, where Andre visited with us uh, with aragonite crystal fans and Gabriel is taking a look at that here. This is the classic uh, Sembra uh, query. And this is the other query that Gabriel is looking and you, you can have a nice look at a uh, 3D representation here, uh, two, um, two sides of the aragonite, pseudo aragonite because now they are calcite crystal fans, okay? And on top of that, we got a possible unconformity uh, that was suggested by seismic data, interpretation of seismic data and isotopic rates. Uh, and above that, we got this unit here where remnants of Claudina and Corumbella and other uh, late Ediacaran fossils were uh, recently described, okay? So uh, what happens to the carbon isotopes here is that they quickly became, uh, began to rise, okay? And we got lots of life going on as shown by the colonum stromatolites and uh, associated with this microbial mats. We got the Claudina, we got all kind of uh, grazers and stuff. Okay, so now I'm jumping to the end of the stratigraphy just to show you a better um, age constraint uh, where uh, last year, Deborah, she dated a tough uh, layer at the top of the unit here. And this tough layer, he ordered zircons as young as uh, 520 million years. So now we are uh, clearly inside the Cambrian. But what happens here that's really interesting is that uh, after the Claudina boom, uh, life disappears 
from the basin. So uh, with this age here, we're supposed to be stumbling upon typical Cambrian fauna, but we ain't got nothing. Uh, it seems that uh, after a boom of life, uh, something happened that uh, conditions became hazardous to life. So even though we are way inside the Cambrian by now, we ain't got uh, no more uh, macrofossil content, okay? And what we got uh, regarding redox proxies, this is just two of the papers that deal with that, uh, like iron speciation and chromium isotopes, senior anomalies, trace metal uh, concentrations, etc. They show that we have some kind of whiffs of oxygen in the post-glacial uh, waters. We'd expect that in the cap carbonate in the cap stone, but maybe this was just melt water influence because upsection the basin uh, quickly becomes an oxy, ferruginous. And then uh, during the middle bumblebee interval of high uh, Delta 13 C, all of the proxies show anoxic conditions, okay? So it seems that something happened here. And this was interpreted by a student of mine that uh, you are kind of restricting the basin, okay? So uh, up to the time where you got the Claudina and Corumbella remnants, uh, you're still connected to the global ocean here. But then as the Amazon craton comes and collides, you restrict the basin. And as you restrict the basin, uh, you're becoming uh, closer and closer to a fully uh, uh, landlocked situation where you're not ventilating the basin anymore and you become uh, a fully anoxic, stagnant water mass that was becoming uh, hazardous to life. So that's an explanation of why you ain't got uh, macrofossil content after this fist bloom, bloom of uh, metazoans, okay? And this is something that uh, probably will come out soon, okay? I uh, just got the first review out, where we try to put all of this together in a orogenic basing framework, okay? So what happens here is that uh, you got the progressive restriction of the bamboo basing as the, the components of West Gondwana are coming together. So you, you, you collide the Western African Craton, Paranapanema, Rio de la Plata. So you, you, you're building the Brasilia origin here. And probably you got a good situation for Claudine and Corumbella because as you collide, uh, you, you're getting a mountain belt here that its erosion will provide nutrients and will probably bury down a lot of organic carbon. And then you have uh, more oxygen available in the basin. And then this is the optimum conditions for Claudina, Corumbella, et cetera. But as the, the continental peaks uh, continue to come together, then you just let lock the basins from all sides. And then this become hazardous to life, okay? Because now you're, 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 you're starting to have uh, fully anoxic conditions and you can have um, complex life developing on that, okay? So there's a lot of proxies that you can use to track this uh, restriction. And I think the most impressive is the decoupling. So here the dots are, are a compilation of all of the carbonized dope data from the bamboo basin, okay? And at some point around 550 million years or so, uh, they decouple from the global uh, seawater curve. And then you have really positive carbonized dope. That's the middle bamboo excursion. And the same happens uh, with strontium isotopes as well. So you have strontium isotopes here at the cap stone uh, sequence that they, they mirror the global strontium curve. But then at some point here, the strontium isotopes decouple from the global curve and you have really low values on the upper bamboo group. Uh, they go down while the, the Neoproterozoic strontium curve goes up, continues to go up, okay? You got widespread anoxia as uh, discussed in the trace metal and iron speciation and other proxies. And you have a five-fold increase in nutrient availability. So uh, here I illustrate this uh, with zinc, but all of the trace metals that can be used as nutrient tracers, they show that you have a major input of nutrient and maybe this become hazardous to life because they feel the positivity uh, feedback of productivity. So lots of organisms, they're consuming the oxygen. The basin is becoming anoxic. So maybe uh, uh, overburden of nutrients could have become hazardous to life here. Life disappears 
as I just put here, life thrives here, called Aina Corumbella, but then at, during the MIB, it disappears. And what I think that's interesting, we just plugged in here the epsilon uranium of the carbonates and silicic elastics. They go up as strontium go down, as you would expect. So probably you are eroding the juvenile terrains uh, that I showed you before in the surrounding monobelts, okay? Okay, so now uh, I'm just finishing here. Um, one interesting outcome of that is that uh, how do you explain the, the middle bamboo excursion, right? And one thing that was um, that was proposed is that it, it it was generated in a large metanogenic basin. Okay, so uh, Huang Kui and others here they try to model the very high uh, delta thirteen C carbon values of the carbonates. And through uh, uh, the classic um, double sink model, uh, where you have um, inorganic carbon going into carbonates and organic carbon going into uh, black shales or whatever, uh, you would need to, to bury down circa 70% of all of the organic carbon to reach the, um, the high values here. So this is not really um, something that uh, would be realistic. So one thing that came upon is this probably methanogenic basin. And this is supported by uh, low sulfate contents and other proxies that show that this anomaly is regional and was developed in anoxic conditions. So uh, if you got anoxic conditions in a methanogenic basin, what happens is that you don't, uh, you can, the CH4 can escape the basin without becoming re-oxidized, okay? So if the middle bamboo excursion was generated through the combination of basin restriction that would lead to a large epirogenic, uh, epirogenic metanogenic basin, what might have been the influence of the large amounts of CH4 that were probably released to the atmosphere? So this is something that I think would be interesting as a research avenue, uh, future research avenue in Western Gondwana basins. Uh, if we are correct to think about that those basins, all of them became progressive to landlocked, and some of them at least were methanogenic, what would be the effect in the global climate and in the global uh, atmospheric chemistry, okay? Uh, and this is something we can think about for the greenhouse uh, effects that uh, we know about in the Cambrian basins, okay? But there are alternative viewpoints, okay? So Gabriel Wulang and others uh, suggested that not only metanogenesis, but you, you are also reworking ancient carbonate platforms that are already uh, presenting high uh, delta 13 C. So this is a missing source that could help explain the high values. Uh, Wang Kui and others, they uh, model the carbon circle, cycle, uh, inserting a third sink that's autogenic carbonate. And then if you have autogenic carbonate as a third sink, you don't need to bury that much of organic carbon, okay? And this is really interesting. Uh, it was another student of mine that found a, that studied a giant graphite deposit in uh, the Arasuri erosion. And this was deposited uh, between 610 and 550 million years. So this could be a probably uh, missing sink for this light carbon. You don't need the methane to be going to the atmosphere, but it could be uh, he incorporated in those basins, okay? So this is just uh, future avenues for studying. I think probably, uh, it will be all of them together. So you got a little bit of methane production, you got a little bit of uh, ancient carbonate reworking, orogenic carbonate, and then probably some of those light carbon uh, went through to graphite uh, bearing basin and stuff. So a lot of stuff here to think about and to develop in the future years, okay? So, okay, uh, I'm sorry if I, I, I used a lot of time, but uh, if you want more information, about our project that uh, this is the seed project for this year. And we have uh, some presence here in the social networks and stuff. So you can just enter there and see what we're trying to develop and uh, we'll try to keep it updated with the later papers and stuff like that. Okay, thanks for watching then and here you go. Uh, thank you, Fabricia. Uh, it was good talk. Uh, so I'm sure people have uh, a lot of questions for you. So maybe uh, people who have questions, maybe you can indicate um, in a chat room and when I, this way I can sort of uh, have a 
prioritized uh, and when uh, uh, once I call you, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. So, so maybe as we wait and uh, I start with my uh, questions, I have uh, actually two questions. Uh, first, uh, uh, so at 900, uh, it, it's clear you have large igneous province, but do you have evidence that uh, uh, it's led to development of passive margin or could it be just a failed drift? Uh, so that's the first question. And second, about the upper part of bamboo. Um, so this uh, tooth uh, would be nice to reproduce it with precise team stages. But regardless of it, um, I'm wondering, uh, so you develop anoxia and there are two ways how to develop it, either through high productivity, but um, it seems like you don't have, or another way would be through high hydrothermal input. And you have low strong semi-isotope values, you have high zinc and nickel, uh, other elements, so could it be that you have a basin with large hydrothermal and magmatic activity, but on another hand, uh, I'm not aware that there is magmatic activity on this level, except you have large concentration of gluconite. So, so if you could. Uh, uh, for the first uh, section, uh, for the first question, sorry. Um, some of the some of those basins, I think they could represent uh, failed rift arms. Okay, so the ones that uh, we can see the provenance shift that they they, they become like uh, you start with basal conglomerates and then you have some mafic volcanics, then up above that uh, you got uh, the platformal quartzites and especially carbonates that seems to represent large platforms. So. Those basins, I think uh, we have good uh, sedimentary and stratigraphic um, evidence that you're going through uh, from a rift phase to a drift phase. And then if you follow those sequence uh, up section, you will find the probably uh, ophiolite remnants, okay? So we can- But do you know uh, age for this quartzites and carbonates So Only from the triple zircon okay. and the the, old, the youngest, the triple zircons are protonic provenance. So um, I agree that we can have different interpretations for that, like for each of the, the, the stratigraphic uh, sequence, but uh, to interpret large rift sequences that uh, do not uh, evolve to drift sequences, I would expect uh, sedimentary sequences that are more like uh, what you see in the East African rift or so. So lots of lake stuff, uh, rivers, continental stuff, with lots of, um, depending on the mag mag magmatic activity of the rift, with uh, bimodal uh, volcanism or something like that. So I think uh, from a sedimentary point of view, uh, the basins that I've shown here, they look more like a rift drift transition than uh, failed rift arms. But some of those basins could uh, probably represent failed rift arms, okay? Especially the ones that we have lots of conglomerates uh, of uh, bordering faults. It seems that you have uh, lots of mechanical uh, reworking of the basin borders, okay? So I don't know if that helps, but... <laughs> yeah, I didn't imply that the whole succession is failed drift. I was just wondering if you have evidence for break up at 900. Uh, yes. But what I think is interesting to, to, to judge on that because uh, there, there are currently proposals that the whole uh, section represents like 3,000 3, kilometers or so of uh, failed reef arms. So uh, I think from the, from the field point of view, like the sedimentary rocks that we see in the field, I don't think they, are, they, they look like uh, failed reef, but that's a, a long discussion there. And then for the for the anoxia to develop, uh, what I think is really interesting here. So I shown you that uh, if if we believe in all of the evidence for uh, petrographic field geochemical evidence for arc rocks, 
then we will have uh, long strings of art rocks that were uplifted in the orogenic areas. And then the erosion of this will give you the uh, sediment provenance for the bamboo basin. So for the hydrothermal input, we're just beginning to scratch the surface of it, but I believe we can try to track down if um, and maybe even model uh, what's the volume of art rocks or juvenile rocks that we will need to erode in order to develop the anoxia we see in the bamboo basin through hydrothermal input. And then try to compare this to the nutrient boost and um, high productivity rates and see which factor would uh, be the most, the most uh, important or if both of them would be important in uh, developing this anoxia and see uh, what would happen in this basin. What's really interesting is that after this first, this first uh, boom of metazoans, then life disappears. And it, it, you would expect like, if this is like the Nama basin or if this is like the Corumba basins and stuff, you would expect to find uh, more life there. But uh, it seems that's a little bit different. Uh, you begin, uh, and I think it has something to do with the landlocking of the basin. So we just have to trace down what are the factors that landlocking would lead to that would be hazardous to life in this point. Okay, thank you. Uh, Shuhei asks if you have a field photograph of unconformity in the lower Setelogos. Uh, formation. Wow. This, this is another great debate. Okay. And uh, I think what's interesting here is that this unconformity began to be discussed before all of the, the controversy about uh, cap dolo stones, cap carbonates, etc., and of the age of the bamboo group uh, through seismic data and through uh, isotopic break. So at the base of the bamboo in various sections, uh, you got an isotopic break that goes from negative values to around, uh, sometimes to around zero, sometimes to around plus five. But the important thing is that this is not uh, continuous, is a break. So uh, for a quick answer to uh, Shuhai, we do not have any um, direct field evidence for this. So this is very discussed right now. Uh, what I think is interesting here, and you know it much, much better than me, all of you, uh, in, in a lot of basins, uh, the Akron Cambrian basins here, it seems uh, this carbonate siliciclastic sequences. Sometimes you start with something that seems uh, post, post glacial cap dolostone, but then up section, you got late Ediacaran um, metazoans and uh, macrofossils and stuff like that. So I think this is something that repeats elsewhere. Okay, it, does, it doesn't have to be a nonconformity. It could be a, a condensed section that you're seeing at some parts of the basin and not in other parts of the basin, okay? Uh, but I think there's compelling evidence that you got both the post-glacial Marino and Cap Dolostone, and then up above the sequence, you got uh, the fossils that's supposed to be late in the acronym, okay? So we are uh, simplifying this uh, oversimplifying it maybe by calling it a nonconformity, but it could be other stuff. It could be uh, some kind of condensing section where below you got carbonate, above you got carbonate. So it's really hard to, to, um, to recognize it in the field if you ain't have the right outcrops. Okay, and next question from Eric Sperlin. I don't know, Eric, do you want to unmute yourself and ask or should I read your question? Okay, maybe I start with reading. So uh, Eric ask, uh, um, what's the environment in which uh, graphite deposits formed? Uh, so if you could give more description of environment and how we formed and developed. Uh, this is kind of hard here because those graphite deposits, they are in a high grade paragnisic unit. So you got aluminum nice, and uh, within the aluminum gneiss, you got uh, 
flake graphite. And this is like uh, fake deposits of flake graphite. So just uh, interpreting that this flake graphite deposits, uh, they represent the metamorphism of ancient black shales, okay? Like carbon rich shales, that when you take this to high grade level of metamorphism, then you form flake graphite, okay? Uh, and then this flake graphite got what you would expect of very negative uh, delta 13C um, signatures. So uh, we just wondered if this could be uh, probably another, some kind of uh, restricted basin there, where for some reason, you just sucked in all of the organic carbon in this part of the basin. So maybe the redox conditions are different there. You could sucking the organic carbon there. And uh, this was put in a position that after metamorphism, uh, it could develop into high grade ore of graphite, okay? But we don't really know it for sure. We just interpreted uh, interpreting a high grade unit, a high grade meta sedimentary unit as a metamorphosed uh, part of the basin that were uh, for some reason contained high amounts of organic carbon, probably in uh, black shales. Uh, but we got like over uh, 1 billion tons of uh, flake graphite in this uh, deposit. So I think that we can model that and see uh, what, what could it mean for um, as a sink, okay? As a sink of organic carbon, as a possible sink of organic carbon. But I, to be honest, I don't really know if you have other forms of, of uh, other ways of forming giant graphite uh, deposits other than metamorphosing black shales, okay? Metamorphosing organic rich uh, shales. So probably we could have some kind of other hydrothermal models or stuff like that, that people from economic geology will know better. I'm not sure. Um, we're studying this right now because there, there's a lot of uh, attention to graphene uh, and other technological uh, applications of graphite and carbon uh, in the industry. So uh, this is kind of a rock, hot uh, topic of debate right now. Don't know if it answers anything, but. Okay, I think it's good. Uh, I think Shuhai has another question. Um, uh, and he asked, what is the source of relatively non-radiogenic strontium during the uh, MIBI interval, I guess. Is it the uh, middle part of bamboo, I guess? Okay, this, this is a good one because uh, I think this is one of the most uh, outstanding features of the bamboo basin is this decoupling of the strontium uh, signals from the global curve, from the global seawater curve and of the carbon signals, of course. Uh, one interpretation that's being put forward by uh, Uline and by other people studying there, is that you are reworking the basal carbonates, okay? Uh, and this will be a nice interpretation because it will fit actually with the interpretation of an unconformity and the interpretation that you are uh, refurnishing phosphate and carbonates to the basin and increasing alkalinity and et cetera. So one interpretation is that you are reworking carbonate platforms inside the basin again. And the other interpretation is that you are having uh, some kind of input from uh, volcanic arcs at this part. So uh, you are still having input from juvenile, uh, relatively juvenile rocks uh, that are coming from the mantle edge. Um, they could come from, from far away or from the mountains that are just uh, beside. And I think this is also a nice interpretation because of the neodymium isotopes that they are not as, as, as well stratigraphically constrained as the strontium isotopes, but they also show that uh, while you have strontium going down, neodymium is coming up. So probably you are eroding uh, areas where you got juvenile stuff. So I, I, I would put my, uh, my expectations in two, in this two sources, reworking of ancient uh, carbonate platforms and the uh, hydrothermal input from volcanic arcs, okay? Um, 
So uh, with uh, copper and nickel coming to the basin and also non-radiogenic strontium, probably juvenile and mafic source would be would be good, which is yeah. not really uh, what you have in arcs. Yeah, th those are actually we need some more specific uh, proxies for that kind of stuff, and this is a good. Uh, future avenue of research, try to find the proxies that would, would, would lead us that like chromium or uh, all of the trace metals and stuff and try to compare it with the volume of possible arc rocks that we got surrounding this, uh, this, this, uh, this basin. Uh, and in this arc terrains, most of the rocks that are supposed right now, uh, they are from the plutonic roots of the arcs. You got some volcanic rocks, but most of them are protonic. So um, you probably have high rates of erosion that some of them, okay, are from Erozoic or recent, but maybe in the Adiacor and Cambrian itself, you already had uh, right, high rates of erosion of those areas. And uh, you have large inputs of uh, nutrients and metals to the basin. But we have to test that with uh, specific proxies. Okay, thanks. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, okay, Juan, uh, who uh, suggests that uh, Jay, uh, Jay Kaufman once proposed that yes. bamboo is cryogenian in age. I was wondering, do you have any comments about it based on your broad view of geology and tectonics? Yeah, that, so this is another great uh, hot topic uh, in the Bambui Basin because uh, right right before that, I guess, uh, I think it was uh, Mahali Babinski, she got a lead lead isochrome on the summer quarry. And this lead lead isochrome uh, yielded about 740 million years. And at the time, uh, Sturgeon uh, glaciation was not as well constrained as it is right now. So they use this cryogenian um, lead lead isochrome to support a sturgeon age for that. But then when you compare the whole stratigraphy and the uh, camo stratigraphy and et cetera, uh, it really is more similar to post marinon ones. So you got everything you would expect from post marinon, marinon uh, cap carbonates like the barite layers, phosphorite, et cetera. Uh, aragonite, this is not uh, of course exclusive of Post marine one. But one thing that I think is the most impressive is the thin and pale and sometimes pinkish cap stone unit that's on the base of the bamboo. And it starts with delta 13C at around minus three and it goes down up section to about minus five. And then only after that, it begins to go up. So this is really specific uh, of, uh, really characteristic of post Marinoan uh, worldwide deposits. Um, it even uh, was used like a, probably one of the global depositional or diagenetic, early diagenetic or depositional events in the world. So uh, I don't see a problem if people wanna try to interpret that uh, differently, like, but then uh, you have to, to take into account that this kind of event, like uh, thin and pale and flinty and uh, pinkish cap dollar stone uh, going down the Delta 13 C would have to repeat in the geological history. And then uh, you have to have some kind of process that's not unique to the post uh, Marinoan uh, deposits there, okay? Um, we also have the triple zircons that are around 630 and so, so there, there's other lines of evidence that uh, this is younger than what you would call uh, Sturgeon, okay? Uh, and we were working in trying to get direct uh, age constraints on that. And that's something that I forgot to mention, but uh, I think it was you, Andre, that, that, that talked about Tim's ages. And I really agree with that. Uh, like uh, right now, the, the tough age that we got in the top of the Bamboo Basin, that's uh, laser ablation. ISPMS. So probably if, if you do uh, isotope dilution, uh, chemical abrasion, and then you, you take it to the TIMS machine, 
you probably will have those, those zircons dancing around the Concordia a little bit. So we have to take this 520 million years age with a grain of salt there. And then uh, whenever we have some, someone that uh, is willing to pluck the zircons out of the resin and trying to put it through ID team's work, then I think we will have better uh, constraints for the ages of this zircons and stuff. Yeah, I tried to get uh, access to this mount, but apparently it was lost or something happened to it. So it's not, well, from what I that's understand, bad. Not, not, not available anymore. Uh, so Dr. Uh, Buyo uh, from Cameroon has a question uh, for you, Fabricio. Um, so I'll read it. Uh, 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 great, and thanks, Fabricia. I am uh, Marilyn from Cameroon. Some components of Cariris Vilches are just identified within the Central African fold belt in Cameroon. Can you give short description and the geodynamic context? Maybe for uh, other people, you can explain what Cariris Vilches is. Uh, okay, so this uh, is a very kind of enigmatic feature of the Northeastern Brazil. We got a, a belt of granites and uh, rhyolites and stuff like that, that goes through like 700 kilometers or so. And they are all dated at around 1.0, so 1 billion years. And uh, some people interpret this belt as a magmatic arc that was uh, bordering Rodinia, okay? So it was like marginal to Rodinia. And I include myself in those people. Other people interpret it as a rift setting. So it's really like uh, uh, extreme interpretations here, extreme views. And then uh, one thing that's interesting is that it was never before described in Africa, right? So one thing that Merlin and uh, other people working there could be interested is, is in finding similar rocks in Africa because they just truncate at the Eastern Atlantic coast in Brazil. And then you don't know where they are in Africa. So Mehla, I think uh, you you would be more uh, more fit to explain where what are those uh, remnants in Africa. But what I've heard about it's uh, mainly inherited components. So some the uh, granites that uh, people found 1.0 billion year zircons as inherited components of those. But then you told me that uh, the geological mapping that you are conducting, right? Uh, people started to find some, some probably uh, components of uh, 1.0 billion years that could represent the continuation of this Cariris belt in Africa. This is one of the most contentious issues in uh, geology of Brazil right now. No one really knows what this means. So. <laughs> I hope with the recently described occurrences in Africa, we can try to compare this and see if we can arrive at a consensus if this is uh, some kind of accretionary system that's bordering Rodinia or is some kind of rift system as some people believe. I don't know what to point on that, but. Okay, and Paul has a comment. I don't know if you want to unmute yourself or should I read it? Uh, um, okay, uh, maybe I start reading it and Paul can continue. Uh, deep sea fan deposits in southern Ka uh, Kaoko belt are dominated by detrital zircons around 1 billion years. What is the source? Okay, so could one of the possible sources be the uh, bimodal uh, rhyolite basalt units in the West Congo belt? Uh, because you have uh, extensive and uh, really impressive uh, rift related volcanics there. And I believe these are not only in the belt, but maybe a little bit inside of the craton as well. So you are rifting the craton borders and you're generating this major. Um, rhyolite basalt units. So one, one possibility is that uh, for some reason, you are incorporating zircons from this uh, units uh, saltwards, okay? 
in the southern border of the Congo Craton or the Angola block if, uh, if, if they are not uh, connected, okay? Uh, another option is uh, during the, the Tonian rifting of the, of the Congo Craton or Central African bloc, I believe in that, uh, we got uh, some kind of sparse, both uh, A-type uh, granites and uh, some kind of uh, mafic dikes, but mafic dikes wouldn't give you enough zircons, I guess. So we're really looking for the uh, felsic components there. Okay, so I, I would believe uh, the, the best candidate would be the rift related volcanics in the West Congo. Okay. But then we have this uh, Caridis belt that we were just discussing. Is sitting right a thousand kilometers to the north. But if we think about, uh, I don't know, maybe if this is an arc system, it could shed the tritus elsewhere, like uh, inside the paleocontinental uh, domains. And then it could be reworked towards the, the, the deep sea fence. I don't know, it's a possibility. Okay, good. I, I just realized that uh, I should have unmuted everyone. Uh, so at least uh, I think now everyone should have an option to unmute themselves. Sorry. Uh, I never used this in Zoom. Okay, so anyone, uh, so right now we don't have any more questions. So everyone who has questions, please uh, feel free uh, to step in. Uh, maybe Paul has some questions. Uh, Paul suggested, I guess, to talk uh, on a somewhat similar topic from uh, from African side perspective. So we we'll try to arrange it either later this year or more likely next year. So, so anyone, uh, floor is open for everyone. Just, I think uh, you should be able to unmute now, uh, if I'm correct. So feel free to ask questions. Just uh, stop sharing the screen here. Okay. Yeah, better. Now I can see the chat, the size that I, I, I don't need to put it over here. Okay, maybe I stop recording, but uh, if 